The Oklahoma City Thunder fall in game number three to the Dallas Mavericks. What went wrong for Oklahoma City? How can they adjust, and what's the series outlook now? You are Locked On Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Locked On Thunder podcast, on the Locked On Podcast Network, your teams every day. I am your host, media member, and inside the Thunder beat writer, Ryland Styles. Follow me on Twitter at Rylan underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LO ThunderPod. The Oklahoma City Thunder fall to the Dallas Mavericks in game number three. They now trail in the postseason for the first time all postseason long, all playoffs long. Uh, after sweeping the Pelicans and going 1-1 in the first two, they're now playing from behind, heading into a Monday game, game four, that is a must win. Like you're going to have to get that victory if you're Oklahoma City for this series to stay within reach. Obviously, you tie it up and get and regain home court advantage and, and go to a best of three from there. It was uh, overall, I think, frustrating experience for Thunder fans watching this game. It was another game where you're sitting there and they did not play like themselves uncharacteristic turnovers, uncharacteristic missed shots. They just were not them. They didn't have their best pitch tonight is the line that you can go with. Now, sometimes even an ace pitcher goes out there and an ace pitcher might never have his best pitch on a given outing. That could be this series for Oklahoma City. They could just never regain that, that fastball. But I do believe it'll happen. I do believe that they'll play much better than this, and they're capable of playing much better than this. Because as of this moment, you know, two games don't wash away the body of work of the regular season. It's why you play the regular season. I think that there's obviously points that you know and and, and situations that worry you for the future and worry you for this series. One of them just being the, the outright execution. Of Dallas, like we're, we, you can rattle off some stats here, and this game sounds really even on paper. When you watch that game, some of the glaring, you know, separating factors were: the Thunder had bad turnovers, the Mavericks protected the ball down a stretch, the Mavericks and Thunder got into a shot making contest, a, a tough shot making contest, and the the Mavericks have Kyrie and Luca, and they hit tough shots, and the Thunder missed th- their opportunities at times. So, you know, the officials are going to be a big talking point. Josh Giddy and their rotations will be a big talking point. The biggest, in my opinion, is the fact that the best three-point shooting team in the NBA shot 33% from three again. It is the fact that your big three, Sands SGA, didn't give you enough. SGA was awesome. SGA had 31 points, 10 rebounds, six assists, uh, a steal, and, and he had five blocks. Like, he was great. I think that he gave you enough to win this game. But you'd go down the list. Jada was seven for, uh, you know, Jada was seven for 12 in this game. He missed some mid range jumpers that he typically does. He never had that takeover moment. He went back to the locker room with an ankle injury. And then post game, he eventually said he was fine, but he played coy a little bit of like asking if he actually did go back to the locker room. Shea pressed him for an answer, and he said he's fine. Uh, Mark said he was good enough to go back in. Who knows? And at this point, you're never going to be 100%. Like, J-Dub's not 100%. Luke is not 100%. It's a battle of attrition. It's a war of attrition out there. But like, J-Dub played fine, but it's a lot to ask of a sophomore. You need more. You just need more. Chet Holmgren was unbelievable defensively. You cannot oversell his defensive impact in this one. You just can't do it. What what he was able to do taking away the Mavericks from the paint was incredible. Four blocks and a steal, a plus one. The only starter to have a positive plus minus. Otherworldly defensively. Offensively, though, he took nine shots. And those nine shots are tied with Lou Dort and one more than Josh Giddy. You've got to find a way to get him more shots. And, and part of this is not on Chet Holmgren. Part of this is on the guards. 
and the ball handlers and the playmakers of missing him on pick and rolls and pick and pops uh, as they've done a lot this season. Part of it also is when the ball gets swung to you, instead of looking for the next action or looking for the next uh, you know, opening, take the shot. This team has been fantastic at playing team basketball, at working in possessions. But this is a star-driven league, and on the biggest stage, you've got to have the attitude of a good shot for Shea, a good shot for Chet, a good shot for J-Dub is better than working to try to get a great shot for Lou or a great shot for Wiggins or a great shot for J-Will or a great shot for Kaysen or even a great shot for Isaiah Joe. No, like these guys are awesome. Yo, know, you will never hear me say a bad word about Wiggins or any of the other guys that we just rattle off. But there's a reason why you have this big three and why you need them to step up and take shots and make shots. Now, I think that this naturally, as the discourse of the playoffs goes, is going to have massive overreactions. It's going to have massive uh look backs on the trade deadline, look backs on uh, how this team is constructed and, wh and what this team does right, what this team does wrong. At the end of the day, you lost this game 105-101. You had a fantastic stretch in the, th in the third to get up 10 points, and you blew it. But 105-101, with Wiggins, who's been phenomenal this season and every opportunity he's been, he's been given, missed three good looks from beyond the arc. J. Will, who caught fire in this series earlier, is 0 for 2 from 3. Kaysen, who's been, who's been nothing but steady as a rookie, is 1 for 3 from 3. So your defense was good enough. And for as much talk of Luka and Kyrie as there's going to be, you cannot defend those two guys better than 22 points on 41% shooting for Luka and 58% shooting for Kyrie. It does not exist. The defense was there, just as the defense has been there all series long. Like There was a lot of praise for the Mavericks offense after Thursday. They made incredibly tough shots. The Thunder, through three games, have made Dallas work for it. And, and two of the three, they've limited the Mavericks offense. It's about playing complimentary basketball, turning this quality defense into offensive opportunities. And yes, they've got to do a better job of limiting P.J. Washington. He goes off again, 27 points in this one. Lively had 12 off the bench. Hardaway Jr. had eight. Like, those things matter. But 105 points against this Mavericks team is nothing to be ashamed of. And you kind of just live with, you know, if, if P.J. Washington is going to have a 5 for 12 night from three. And he might do that again two more times and, and win the series for Dallas. But that was the, the risk you're signing up for this time a week ago, whenever you, you were previewing this series. Now, can they do things better? For sure. Shea said as such. When they were asked about P.J. Washington, Shea just said his name, P.J. Washington, man. And then mentioned that they had to turn his water off. I'm curious to see if they are going to change anything up. I mean, they're, they are going to change something up, but what is that change going to be? Uh, could it change possibly be, uh, you know, stay home on PJ and, and and stay contested with him, and force these other guys to beat you? I don't. I don't really have the answers other than these guys playing to their averages that they've played to all year long, both for the Thunder and for Dallas. So we'll see if there's anything that, that actually happens deeper than that for either side. But as the Thunder fall to Dallas, people are going to act like the sky is falling. And you're behind the eight ball in a big way. You have to win Monday. A lost Monday and the series is over. There's been there's been 3-1 comebacks, comebacks before. There's been many 3-1 three, uh, three comebacks uh, in recent vintages, of course. But it takes a special kind of, you know, series to have that happen, especially against Luka and Kyrie, that is unpredictable, and you don't want to put yourself in. You don't want to push yourself in that moment at all. So I, I think that you got to win one in Dallas. You didn't win one in this game. The Thunder have not been good in Saturday afternoon games, period, this season. They have not been good in the one Saturday afternoon game that they played this year in Dallas, where they got just absolutely obliterated. Uh, and in this one, 
for as bad as the Thunder played, they lost by four points, and, and you have things to uh, build upon. There's also a, a multi-layered system here where um, you can really get into the weeds and you can really harp on every little detail that happened uh, in this game, and, and we're going to do that. We're going to belabor every single point. But the biggest overarching theme is that it's a make-or-miss league. The Thunder only hit 33% of their threes, and the Mavericks hit tough shots on the stretch, didn't turn the ball over, and got the P.J. Washington game again. So now you're on P.J. Washington games. Are there more of them to come? Will the Thunder ever throw their best punch and their best pitch? Those two things is going to decide this series. If you get another P.J. Washington game or two, it's over. If the Thunder recover and, and play the way that they've played all season long, then they're going to be able to make a difference and and get back on track uh, uh, this series. And, and it's by far going to be a long one. I also just think that there's a huge you know, difficulty grasping what playoff basketball is after it was gone away for so long. And even in the bubble, like there was no travel. You were not going to road arenas. And that team just embodied house money. Like no one really cared. Like he, of course, every time fan wanted to win against the Rockets in the bubble, but like it was not make or break like this feels. Um, and you're not as invested in the, in the sense of like the long-term growth of that team because everyone knew it was going to be over um, moving forward with that, with that bubble team. So it's been a long time since you've felt this, especially in the second round, because it's been since 2016 uh, that you've gotten to the second round. But these things happen. Like series are long. You've got to handle the gaps in them. And we'll see what this center team is made of. This is going to be a fantastic um, opportunity for them. And it could be one that they're not ready for. It could be one that they're surprisingly ready for. You got to wait and find out Monday of like, can they handle heading into a must-win game on the road with all the momentum against you? We've had two duds of games collectively. Can they handle that? Can they save their season Monday? What adjustments are going to be made on Monday? What are they willing to do? One of the most surprising things has been the waning effort levels and the waning activity levels on the glass and you know not being careless with the basketball. If you're not being careless with the basketball your, your entire season, like those things, can you get back to the basics a little bit if you're Oklahoma City? But this is a very tough team, and there's a reason why uh, if you go back and listen to every single one of the Who Should the Thunder Want to Play podcast that we did, the Mavericks were at the top of my list of like they should not want to play Dallas. Because you still have not gotten another worldly Luka game, like just an unbelievable Luka game. You've not gotten one from Kyrie either. So who's going to uh, win the race to four wins? So far, the advantage goes to Dallas. And there's a lot to get into with Josh Giddy, with the team as a whole. We'll talk about that coming up. But first, I want to say right now, but your friends over at FanDuel, check out FanDuel. They are fantastic because FanDuel makes every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with the winning of any $5 bet. That's $150 bucks in bonus bets that you can use on the spreads, money lines, player props, and more. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn right now. Make every moment more at FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. When you go there, you're going to have a lot of fun because you can not only bet on the NBA, but baseball and hockey playoffs and much more. But we care about the NBA here. The opening line for Monday's must-win game for OKC, Thunder two-point dogs on the road. So basically a pick them on the road in the American Airlines Center on Monday night. You can go place your bets at FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. Also, I want to say right now about our good friends over at Prize Picks. Check out Prize Picks right now by going to prizepicks.com slash locked in NBA. That's prizepicks.com slash locked in NBA. And when you do, you can play the most exciting number one fantasy sports app. When you go there, uh, the Prize Picks folks will let you uh, play the game where you have more or less than their Prize Pick projections. So, uh, whenever you go there, that's all you got to do. You're not playing against people who just have all these algorithms and all these statistics and everything else. It's just you versus the projected numbers. That's it. You're not playing any fantasy sharks who just know way more than you do to make you lose. For example, you go, you load it up. Will Chet have more or less than one and a half blocks? 
you pick more, you watch the game Monday. Does he have more than one and a half blocks? If he does, boom, you've won that simple, that easy. So with the playoff action, you can turn $10 into a thousand right now. Uh, if you get as little as four correct picks at prize picks, which is America's number one fantasy sports app, uh, you can go there and play all their games and have a lot of fun at prize picks, uh, with their playoff action. Go there, prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. The Thunder were beat in the rebounding category 48-41. The Thunder had 13 turnovers to 13 turnovers. So, like, you're not making up the margins there. And you end up losing by four. I think that one of the biggest things to talk about besides, like, the fact that you need more from Chet offensively and you need more from J-Dub and, and then you need – another Wiggins game like that you got in game one. You need, you need a, a case and Wallace game. Like you, you need those things to happen for you. One of the biggest things to talk about is going to be Josh Giddy. The opening stretch from Josh Giddy was not good. He had his own area killed in the corner and it really clogged things up and was, and was having J dub having Chet driving into the teeth of the defense. I mean, Che driving into the teeth of the defense and uh, that caused some turnovers as well. He got better after halftime where they used him as a screener, as a roller in the dunker spot. They uh, also, you know, let him get out and run a little bit where he threw that lob to J-Dub and allowed the Thunder to go on that in that run that put them up 10 and really made you feel like, okay, this is a great response by this young Thunder team. They then let go of the rope and, and lost the game down the stretch. But ultimately, one of the interesting parts about Josh Giddy was that, like, he was awful to start the game. He got better um, in his second stint. And the, and the curious part about it is he was still a minus one in 13 minutes, much better than his 10-minute showing where he was a minus 20. Um, but you can't really afford to put yourself behind the eight ball every game and play from behind every game. And what's been you know, monitored this whole year is that like the Thunder, for as willing as they are to explore the roster, for as... Um, you know, adventurous as they've been and, and, and tinkering and changing rotations and changing lineups, they've never given themselves the shot to see what it looks like for Josh to come off the bench or, or for anyone else to get in the starting lineup outside of injury. So I don't think they're going to start now. And I don't think that Josh played bad enough to, to um, tinker with the starting lineup in the sense of like this one-on-one -on -one game. But again, you do play better without him on the floor in this series. And you have options to start faster and you need a fast start on Monday without a doubt. So it seems like the perfect time to, to change things. But this is the rare change that you would make without having any sort of uh, previous data on it, if you will. But I don't think that Josh Giddy was the reason that he lost this game. I just don't. Um, one for four from three. Uh, hit some tough shots. I, I thought he got fouled a couple of times that they didn't call. Uh, nine points, two boards, an assist. Again, up and down defensively from him, but he only played 13 minutes. The biggest thing for Josh Giddy was just like the only complaint you can have is that he he was a big reason why the Thunder got to a slow start. And against Dallas, you need as many chances to make those runs like you made in the third quarter as possible. With that being said, that run in the third quarter included Josh Giddy. So it is what it is at this point. And it's, just, and it's something that, as I've said all year long, you've got to just push to the, to the summertime because there's nothing you can do to change it right now outside of just not playing him entirely, and that's not going to happen. I did think that it was interesting whenever uh, J-Dub went to the locker room or to the tunnel with a bike or wherever he went, uh, the, the magical mystery bus, they put Gordon Hayward in for not playing him all first half. A veteran like that, I don't think would have been called upon after, after being called the whole first half, if not for the J-Dub injury. He plays three minutes. He was dreadful in those three minutes, honestly. Uh, yes, Chet Holmgren should have played higher up on that end of, end of third uh, three. But you can't die on that screen either. Like, two wrongs don't make a right. Bad by Hayward. Uh, Chet should have played up again. Uh, you know, the same mistake he made uh, on, on Thursday. But it was still a bad job by Hayward. He took a shot, though. 0 for 1. Good for him. Uh, but you're at a point now with Gordon Hayward where, like, Mark has name dropped Kendrick Williams as a, as a guy that you might go to this series. I've written about and talked about the, the idea that Kenrich could be a better option than Gordon Hayward and a better option for this team in this rotation. But Mark's also said that the reason that you have an expansive rotation in the playoffs and especially early in the playoffs is that it's unfair to these guys to just kind of dust them off and uh, put them into a series whenever you need them the most. That's what you're looking at right now. Like 
Kenrich Williams has not played legitimate playoff minutes since game one of the postseason. He got into some garbage time in New Orleans, and now your back's against the wall, and you need this win Monday. You need this win Monday. And you're going to go to Kenrich Williams now? I don't think so. And so that's where the biggest adjustment just simply comes from making your shots and not turning the ball over and providing consistent 48-minute level energy and effort. It sounds simple, but it's very tough to do. It's very tough to do. But this was a rock fight. This was playoff basketball. And at the end of the day, the Mavericks had two better closers tonight. And so how are you going to respond as this young team heading into your first must-win game? Uh, the players took you know, longer than usual to get into the press conference room today. And when they were there, though, they were business as usual. Like, J-Dub and Shea were joking and, and having fun with the questions. And the vibe seemed to be similar to always, even though they're, they're facing a 2-1 deficit. The series is not over. You know, people are going to freak out and panic with everything. The trade deadline, hack a lively, flopping, everything. If a case in three and a Wiggins three goes down instead of rimming out, Thunder win. And and then the, the conversation is, oh, how great the Thunder are and this young team is ready to be here. Like, they miss shots that were wide open a lot of the times. And people are going to attribute that to being too young. They're going to attribute that to, you know, having no experience. The rim is not checking IDs, right? When the ball gets thrown up there, the rim is not saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. Sorry, you were shot by a 21-year-old and not a 30-year-old. We're rimming you out. Like, that's not how it goes. So the shots are going to fall or they're not. And they've got to start falling for OKC. And at the same token, you, you've got to do a better job of, of getting out to P.J. Washington. He can't have a 29-point game followed up by a 27-point game. You can take it in any way you want to. You can live in the moment, or you can just say, yeah, PJ's not really done this consistently. And the Thunder haven't played this bad consistently. What's going to give? Or is this the start of a new trend? And, and, and each series is different. And uh, honestly, you don't really need a ton of trends in the postseason because the series are so short, it doesn't matter. Like, you're not going to get... Thursday back because you just shot, shot poorly. You're not going to get tonight back because you shot 33%. That's going to stick with you. You shoot 33% again on, on uh, Monday, even though it's not who you've been this whole season, the series is over. It's a wrap. So can they execute? Can they get, make shots in the stretch? We'll see. A uh, couple other things. The flopping discourse. I think it's just silly all the way around. Flopping is a part of basketball right now. The, the, the modern era includes flopping. You either like the sport or you don't. And I I don't begrudge anyone who hates flopping. Uh, I don't begrudge anyone uh, who, who doesn't find it appealing. But at the end of the day, no one of these two teams is more ethical than the other. Yes, Luca complains and cries and flops and, and just always, always, always is doing those things. Yes, Lou Dort sells a ton of contact on screens and and – I don't even really see why Mavs fans are mad about the screen thing because more often than not, it benefits Dallas. You get the call twice a game and you know, 13 other times you're out of position. Like go ahead. If you're, if you're Dallas on the Lou Dort aspect of it. Uh, yes. Like everyone's going to sell calls. Every single person on the floor is. So the flopping stuff, it's the year of our Lord 2024. We've seen this story a million times in every basketball game. Um, you look at this team and you just you have to wonder what they're what they're going to be made of on their first test. I would also say it's your first test. Like you can fail your first exam and still pass the class. So they could fail this test on Monday and head back to the drawing board this summer and and regroup and and push forward. That's not the mindset that they're in, but you could. It's not the end of the world. None of this is the end of the world. It's just basketball as LeBron James said, but it's also um, just one series that, that they're going to learn from good or bad. Even if they come back and win the series, they'll still learn from it and how to handle moments like this. To win in seven, as I predicted, to win in seven, as many of you predicted, as, as I remember from the comment section, the Thunder have to lose three times. 
They've now lost twice. So they've got one more loss coming. I don't think they're the one in seven if they lose on Monday, uh, but they still have another loss coming. There's so much to get into. We'll have another podcast on Sunday. We'll have another podcast on Monday because there's just too much to, to divulge into. And we'll be getting you all set for this series, getting you all set for game four. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun covering this team. And the ride is still going on. The margins are so thin in the playoffs. It's never as good as you think it is. It's never as bad as you think it is. You snap and clear. You stack days. You go zero and zero. Yada, yada, yada. Let me know what you think about this game on the comment section down below. We'll have a mailbag podcast on Sunday. We'll have a series preview, a, a game preview on Monday. So a lot to look forward to. Until next time, be good and be good to one another.